Hi everyone, thanks for waiting and thanks for joining us on uh, yet another installment of the Ripple Leadership Series uh, where we bring interesting and intellectually stimulating uh, speakers on issues around the workplace, leadership, coaching, development, uh, to share their insights with you. Uh, today we're really lucky, we've got Jeff Pfeffer. Jeff is a professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, also a Ripple advisor, and he's someone who has a reputation for being uh, quite blunt, direct, and outspoken, and that's what makes him wonderful. Uh, he's written a number of books uh, a lot about evidence-based management, about um, the reality of what happens in the workplace, not necessarily what the aspirational reality is. And I think it's exciting because uh, often we'll have talks about um, somewhat softer discussions around the workplace, around emotion, around uh, people's desires for meaning, and that's really important. But I was looking forward to today because uh, in his latest book, Power, uh, Jeff really gets down to the details of how things actually happen in a fact-based uh, uh, frame around the, around the workplace. And I think it's an interesting compliment to many of the other people who've been part of our Ripple Leadership Series. So without further ado, I wanted to pass it over to Jeff. He'll, he'll take you through some of the ideas in power. Uh, and we'll open it up for conversation and questions towards the end. So feel free all the way through the event to type in your questions as you go. We'll compile them all, and we'll try to get to them all at the, at the end. Um, with that, pass it over to Jeff. Okay, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending upon where you are. Um, I, what I said to Daniel is that I didn't want to speak, speak for 45 minutes. I think it's hard to say, listen to 45 minutes. I think it's really hard to listen to 45 minutes staring at a computer screen and on the phone. So I don't want to spend very much time, 15 or 20 minutes, going through some core ideas uh, from my most recent book on power. Then uh, I'll have a conversation with Daniel and hopefully have a conversation, at least in some format, with many of you uh, about these ideas. So um, you can look at this presentation as, you know, the kind of a game of name this tune, or name that tune. As you recall, that old quiz show, I could name that tune and you know how many few, uh, you know, slides or ideas. But I think there are basically a relatively few small number of core ideas uh, that help us understand uh, the, the ideas of power and the ideas in this book. Next slide. Yep. And the, so the most important slide is this, which you need to imprint upon your pupils and your retinas and everything else. This is the uh, the book cover, which we paid a designer a lot of money to do. So anyway, that's the title, Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't. And that's what I really want to be talking about today. Okay, next slide. So one of the first and most important things to think about is the qualities that create power, which I think has, I assume many people on the phone are from HR or leadership development backgrounds. Um, the qualities that build power, and I'll talk about them in a second, are not inherent or, you know, not genetically determined. Like every other skill, power is a skill that can be learned. And, and the qualities that build power can be coached for. I know some very good leadership coaches who work uh, really basically off this book. And, and you can actually, you know, build all of these qualities. And the best way to describe them is they're in two categories, will and skill. Uh, you need the will or the, the kind of the drive to do, to accomplish and to get to the top of your organization. And you need the skill in order to do so. And will comes from, first of all, ambition. Uh, you know, do you have the ambition and drive, uh, you know, to succeed? And oftentimes when I teach my class, which I've done now for literally decades on power and politics and organizations to the students at Stanford, at the end of the class or even towards the middle of the class, they will say, I see what it takes in order to become a CEO or to become a leader of a top or the nonprofit or governmental organization. And this is not something that I really want to do. It's, it's, it's not a price I'm, I'm willing to pay. And that's okay. But if you want to be successful, you need to have ambition. Secondly, you need to have energy. Uh, I have a friend, Laura Esterman, who runs a breast care center in the San Francisco. And, you know, she's really transforming the world of cancer care. I can recall talking to her once about uh, joining a conference she was running at 8 in the morning, and I said, you know, 8 in the morning is awfully early, and I remember her comment to me. She said, Jeffrey, if you're going to change the world, you don't begin by taking a nap. And so if you look at the successful people in all walks of life, they are people of enormous energy, um, the people who get by on relatively little sleep, which is something that can be learned. We seem to have moved ahead. Okay, we need to go. There we go. Perfect. Um, focus. 
if you put a magnifying glass, uh, if you put out a bunch of dried grass on your lawn, nothing happens. If you put a magnifying glass over that grass, uh, the grass will oftentimes light on fire. What the magnifying glass has done is focus the sun's rays. It's the same thing that a laser does. Um, <clears throat> focus creates energy, creates force. Um, and that's true for, for, for people working inside companies as well. To the extent that you are trying to do 20 things, you won't get anything done. Um, to the extent you're working on two or three critical things, you're likely to succeed. Persistence and resilience is a, it's the final quality that I think comes under will. There is no one uh, who goes to their career without having substantial setbacks and resistance and opposition, even if you're trying to do something like Laura Esterman is, uh, which is to improve uh, cancer care. So the question is, can you overcome those setbacks and obstacles? Uh, Bernie Marcus, the founder of the Home Depot, wrote a book about the founding of the Home Depot in which he says, the Home Depot, the founding of the Home Depot began with two words, you're fired. Uh, Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase was uh, let go of Citigroup when he, you know, crossed swords with Sandy Weil and Sandy Weil's daughter. Um, it is quite common that you'll have resistance and setbacks. The question is, do you have the persistence to overcome them? And skill. There are four skills that I would emphasize. One is self-knowledge and self-reflection. Are you, um, are, do you know yourself? And do you know your strengths and weaknesses? Just like companies need to know their strengths and weaknesses in order to be strategically effective, you need to know your strengths and weaknesses to know how to put yourself in the right place that plays to your strengths and avoid your weaknesses. Confidence. One of the things I always tell people is that, you know, on a daily basis, maybe on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, the people in your organization and the people who you are leading will say, will ask themselves, why should I be led by this person? And nobody wants to be led by somebody who doesn't seem to know where they're going. So exuding confidence is, I think, one of the qualities uh, that, uh, that produces power and gets people to follow you. Empathic understanding of others. Uh, there's this common comment in uh, negotiations that you ought to talk about or you ought to negotiate over interests, not positions. If you're going to do that, you have to be able to understand what other people's interests are. Can you put yourself in their place? Do you understand what their interests are so that you can find and strike a deal and figure out a way uh, to move them uh, to help them support you on your path to power? And finally, the ability to tolerate, manage, and handle conflict. I think many people are conflict averse. Many people avoid fights, and therefore, those people who understand that that's something that you want to do will oftentimes be conflictful just as a way of getting you to step down. Uh, next slide. All right. The next slide is probably going to be troublesome to many people, but it's based upon a lot of social science um, research, as is everything I'm talking about. In the, in the literature on person perception, Susan Fisk talks about the two fundamental dimensions being warmth and competence. Osgood, Tannenbaum, and Suchi talk about three dimensions, potency, valence, likability, and honesty, trust. The problem, uh, I think, for people who want power is that warmth and competence, intelligence and niceness, strength and likability are often seen, they aren't, but they're often seen as being negatively correlated. This is nicely summarized in Amy Cuddy's Human Harvard Business Review article, which is wonderfully titled. I mean, the article is really summarized by the title, Just Because I'm Nice, Don't Assume I'm Dumb. Or an earlier article by Teresa Mobley, Brilliant But Cruel Perceptions of Negative Evaluators. What these studies and what the literature on person perception shows is that to the extent that you are warm and nice, people oftentimes will perceive you as not being tough, and competent, or in the words of Golda Meir, the late Israeli um, <clears throat> Prime Minister, was, she has a wonderful quote, which is, said, "You know, don't be, um, don't be so modest. You're not that good." And so there is, there is this kind of trade-off that people have to make, and oftentimes this is a difficult trade-off, but it's one that uh, that that I think is really uh, consistent with the literature on person perception that you need to be oftentimes a little tougher than you might want to be in order for people to perceive you as competent. Next slide. Um, one of the other things I think if you want to be successful in your career, and this also I think goes against what many people sometimes talk about, is the importance of differentiating or standing out. Uh, this is true for products, it's true for companies, 
It's true for sports teams. It's true for individuals. Uh, part of this is, ex is explained by what Robert Zients, a now deceased social psychologist, called the mere exposure effect. We prefer we choose the familiar. We, we choose what we, re what, we, uh, what we remember, what stands out, uh, so become memorable. There have been lots and lots of studies. I mean, in advertising or marketing, this is not, of course, controversial at all. It's called brand recall. It's called the idea that, you know, so when you see the Energizer Bunny ad, you don't comment on its taste or whatever, but you remember the Energizer brand. Oftentimes, many of the most successful ads are relatively not very pleasant, uh, but, but you remember them. And, and so because you remember them, uh, you're more likely uh, to choose them. It turns out we're more likely to choose things that are familiar to us. Um, there's research that shows people are more likely to marry people who share initials. You're way more likely to remember birth dates that are close to your own birth date. So um, because we, we choose the familiar, you need to become familiar, you need to become memorable. Next is the next piece of the differentiating advice is to find the white space, so the niche activities, locations that may become important but aren't yet, so that competition is less, and then make this, uh, and then make your location valuable. So if you look at Zia Yusuf, a Pakistani who became one of the most senior executives at the software company SAP before he left to become CEO of a startup, Zia never was in marketing, never was in sales. And certainly he was never in engineering because he never um, because he's not a software programmer. But Zia began his career in SAP markets, and when that flamed out, uh, became the first leader of SAP's corporate consulting team, where he was able to have access to and talk to the senior the management and put together a very good internal consulting team. And then he ran SAP's ecosystem unit. And as Zia will say, he says partnerships or sell them the place where you place a lot of talent. So when he went to the ecosystem unit, he said nobody else wanted to be there. It's not like people were begging for the job. But at the end, he built an amazing ecosystem that was written up in Business Week, got lots of visibility for Zia, and created $500 million in revenue for SAP. So this is an example of finding a place where there's not a lot of competition, but where you can actually add enormous value to your organization. And the, the, finally, the final point I would make about the differentiate stand out uh, task or the strategy is that you need to take re reasonable risks. Don't be afraid of rejection or setbacks. No one in sales has, um, is, is unfamiliar with this advice. I mean, if salespeople, every time somebody told them, no, we won't buy the product, gave up and crawled into a hole, um, their careers would be over. And this is just as true regardless of what function you're in. It goes back to the, the story I was telling about Laura Esterman and every other successful person I've seen. If you're going to be successful, you have to not take no for an answer. You have to be persistent and resilient. Next uh, slide. <clears throat> and to pursue the point that I made about um, Zia Yusuf, it's important to build relationships. It's important to build networks. It's important to be known by lots of people. And oftentimes we kind of understand that, but we don't actually do it. Uh, we spend most of our time with the people that we know and like and we work with. And uh, research on job finding and research on influence inside of organizations by my friend and colleague at the University of Chicago, Ron Burt, shows the importance of weak ties. Most jobs are found through weak ties, not close friends and family. Weak ties, people that you've met only once or twice or maybe three times that you don't know very well. And the advantage of weak ties is that the people to whom you're weakly tied tend to have non-redundant information and contacts, while the people to whom you are strongly tied tend to be travel in the same circles as you, know the same things, and to know the same people. So that's the weak ties point. I think one of the interesting ways of building relationships and networks is to do the small task that no one else wants to do. Um, I have a former student who was starting a job at a money management firm in um, San Francisco, and the guy uh, unfortunately was starting one year behind the rest of his entering class because he was in his second year of business school and everybody else had already started the job. And it came time to figure out what he could do to become known in this firm. Now, every money management firm does analyst recruiting. Analysts are the people who come for two or three years 
uh, do the grunt work, the statistical analysis work, the data gathering, and then they often go back uh, to business school. So these are not folks that typically stay around a long time, and therefore they're not considered to be, you know, really core to the firm. And nobody really wants to use, while you need analysts, nobody really wanted to do analyst recruiting. So when an email came out uh, saying, you know, subject line analyst recruiting, uh, this guy, Mike, said, I'll handle analyst recruiting. Everybody else in the firm is busy. I'm just at Stanford finishing my second year. I'll, I'll be happy to take on this task. But if you think about it, taking on the task of analyst recruiting meant that Mike had to, number one, know everybody's schedule and be in contact with them to set up interviews with the analysts. And number two, organize the analyst recruiting dinners at which he, by the way, put himself in the center of the table. So by the end of all this analyst recruiting, he was very well known in the firm, had made personal contact with all the senior people and, for that matter, a lot of the junior people. And by taking on this relatively small task, it built quite an efficient and, uh, and, and quite large social network. Um, one of the words of advice that Keith Ferrazzi, the famous marketing uh, guru who wrote um, Never Eat Alone and Who's Got Your Back says, and it's a great advice, which I think we often don't follow, is in your job, there are certain people who will be critical to your success. Figure out how, who those people are, and if you don't know them, uh, go meet them. And that's the next word of advice. And finally, uh, connect people together. Who could be um, who could benefit from being connected together? If you think of the word entrepreneur, entrepreneur comes from a French word whose uh, the root means to stand between. A venture capitalist stands between uh, people with technology and business ideas and other groups with money. An investment banker stands between um, buyers and sellers. And just as those individuals or those organizations profit by bringing groups together that could otherwise profitably interact but couldn't necessarily find each other, so you can do this by, in quotes, filling the structural holes, by taking groups that interact tightly with e within each other and bringing them into contact um, in, in ways that, that perform brokerage is the best and only way to describe it. Next slide. Next principle of power, work on your reputation. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting how much is based upon reputation. Reputation becomes, of course, self-fulfilling. If I think you're a brilliant person, I will interpret all of your behavior as brilliant. And if I think you're some kind of eccentric, I will interpret your behavior accordingly. Now, one of the things that research shows that you only, is that you only get one chance to make a first impression. So you need to worry a lot about how you come across initially which is something I teach in a session called Acting and Speaking with Power, uh, but you do only get one chance to make a first impression. So one of the things that I see a lot is I see people um, who join organizations and suffer various forms of career setbacks or they, they haven't made a good impression on some of their colleagues or perhaps their boss. And what they will say is, I'm going to work really hard and show these individuals or that individual how wrong they were. And it is, in fact, possible to turn around people's views of you, uh, but it's probably much more profitable and sensible as an expenditure of your energy is to go somewhere else and start over rather than to count on changing people's views. So uh, first impressions are pretty endurable. What is your personal brand? How do you want to be known? What does that imply about what you need to do? We all have personal brands. Um, and Daniel actually introduced me as one of <laughs> kind of the things that I've gotten known for, uh, which is being both provocative but also, frankly, telling the truth. As I said to one of my friends, uh, when you get when you when you're known as a troublemaker for telling the truth, the world has become kind of an interesting place. Um, cultivate the media. A friend, a uh, former student named Marcello Miranda, who uh, works in Brazil and is now CEO of a company. Uh, when he was beginning his career in his early 20s, worked for an organization, uh, people would call the company, nobody wanted to bother with the media, nobody wanted to bother writing articles. Marcello said, I'm going to write articles, I will handle the media calls. And over time, he really developed quite a huge media presence, so much so that there's a picture of him, along with one other person, on the cover of the leading Brazilian uh, business magazine with the uh, under the title of an article, 10 CEOs of the future. 
So what I can tell you is if, if your picture appears on a magazine, uh, the article 10 CEOs of the future, your odds of becoming CEO is approximately one. And Marcello is now CEO of a building products company in Brazil and doing quite well. So write articles, blogs, and columns. Consider getting professional public relations help. Early in your career, I talk to lots of people who say, well, you know, I'll get the public relations help and I'll work on my image when I become CEO or senior human resource executive or senior marketing executive. By the time you become a C-suite executive, you probably don't need public relations help. Uh, the people will find you. Get this early in your career. It's actually a very good way um, uh, to, to build media visibility. And as you recall from the mere exposure effect, uh, this helps make you successful. Next slide. And we're almost at the end here. Act and speak like a leader. I've alluded to that before. Um, Dana Carney, a professor and some colleagues, actually did a fascinating study. She had some people adopt a high power pose. A high power pose is expansive uh, with your arms and legs out and taking up a lot of space. And she had other people randomly selected in her study adopt a low power pose, which would be constrained, your shoulders hunched in, your arms crossed in front of your chest, and so on and so forth. Now, what was interesting is that she actually not only gave people kind of questionnaires to ask how they felt, and obviously the people who had adapted a high power pose felt more powerful, but she actually had done blood tests of these folks. So if they come to the lab, she takes it, does a blood draw, puts them in a high power or low power pose, and then does another blood draw. The people in a high power pose, when she analyzes, or who has a lab actually analyze the blood chemistry, the people in a high power pose, once they were in that pose, had lower levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and higher levels of testosterone, and the reverse was the case for people in a low power pose. So not only does power and your physical uh, kind of attributes affect your perception of yourself and others' perceptions of you, but according to the study published in the journal Psychological Science, power and deposing actually affects your blood chemistry. So as she says, the idea of fake it until you make it turns out actually to be true. Uh, stand straight, make eye contact, uh, don't fidget and use forceful hand gestures. These are all part of acting and speaking like a leader. Next slide. One of the other things that I'll tell you about that may strike you as not being consistent with what you know, there's actually though a lot of research that's supported, goes to this issue of anger. Uh, studies by my colleague Larissa Tedens or Laura Tedens at Stanford and studies by other people as well demonstrate that anger, anger is associated with power. Most people say if you display anger, you must be powerful because how could you get away with losing your temper? Well, because of this heuristic association between anger and power, people who display anger tend to get more status conferred on them and tend to be assumed to have more power than people who um, express sadness or remorse. And this is a study that has been found, uh, been replicated many times, though there are, and we can come back to this later if you're interested, some differences in this uh, between men and women. Uh, men can get away with displaying anger much more than women can. Uh, but in general, my advice is to display anger rather than sadness or remorse. Don't use uh, passive sentence construction and use persuasive language, which is using contrast, lists, vivid, emotion-producing language, uh, humor is very effective, as Salman Rushdie, the famous author, uh, said on the San Francisco radio program, if you can get people to laugh, you can tell them anything, uh, which is, I think, correct. I mean, humor is extremely disarming. And question premises and take it for granted assumptions. One of the things I do in my training on acting and speaking is to show people videos excerpted from the testimony of Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs and Tony Hayward of BP uh, in front of the U.S. Congress. And one of the interesting things about Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman is that when the senators keep accusing him of uh, and Goldman of conflict of interest uh, because they were betting against uh, products that they had just sold their clients, uh, Lloyd Blankfein actually questioned the premises of that and went into a very long didactic explanation as to how markets work. And so he never, uh, he not only did he never admit guilt, uh, but he never really accepted the premise of the, um, of the um, um, senator's questions. Last and final slide. 
So, you know, I mean, acquiring power is, is difficult and hard work and requires all the skills and strategies that we've talked about. Why should you bother to do it? Number one, power can be monetized. When Bill and Hillary Clinton left the White House, they had debts from Whitewater and Monica Lewinsky. Uh, six years later, they had made $107 million. Power is not always monetized. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi didn't monetize their power, but it certainly can be. Notoriety and power can be uh, can obviously be monetized. Watch Donald Trump, who is not only running for U.S. president, uh, but more than that, I think, is, you know, really shows the advantage of the mere exposure effect and the connection between money and, um, and how exposure can, can be translated into money. Secondly, and the tagline, change lives, change organizations, change the world, is the tagline of Stanford Business School, and it is true. If you want to change uh, the treatments for breast cancer, if you want to change, uh, you know, what goes on in the world, either in uh, politics or in the world of your organization, you need to do, do so from a position of power. I recently gave a talk uh, to the Women in Law Conference sponsored by the University of Texas at Austin, and one of the things that's absolutely clear is that if you want to change the fact that women are only 15% of equity partners in law firms, uh, if you want to change the fact that women are, are seriously underrepresented in senior corporate ranks, at least in the United States, and I suspect in Canada as well, you need to be in a position of, of power to do that. And finally, and perhaps least intuitively, research on job control by Michael Marmot, a British epidemiologist and now has been knighted for his work, finds that uh, if you want to predict, for instance, health or longevity or cardiovascular events, and you have a choice between variables such as body mass index, cholesterol level, genetic history, blood pressure, or how much control you have over your job, your conditions of work, it turns out job control is the, most, uh, is the biggest predictor of um, <clears throat> of longevity. Uh, that's because having no control over the conditions of your life is stressful and stress is bad for your health. Uh, so the last line in the book, which is only the, the, the line that I always remember, is seek power as if your life depends on it because in many respects it does. So that was probably about five minutes longer than I wanted to go. It's about a half hour um, since we started 15 minutes late. And uh, with that, I'll turn this back over to Daniel, and he can either engage in a dialogue with me or answer some of your questions, or we'll proceed along. Hey, Jeff. That was great. Really uh, a breath of fresh air. Um, because as you point out, you know, you often hear a lot more about, you know, being nice and supporting people and, 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 and how that's the secret to great organizations. Uh, but I think you rightly point out that uh, individuals who claim the right to have power often are the ones who can change organizations too because they can encourage people to follow and to uh, affect change, to change your behavior. So I, a couple of questions that come out of this. First of all, just what's the reaction to, to this talk in general? I mean, we'll hear from people who are watching right now, but um, do people accuse you of being a cynic, of being a Machiavellian? What, what kind of response are you getting? Well, that's a great question. So first of all, some people accuse me of being Machiavellian, to which I say that would be great. Machiavelli is the only author I know whose books are still known 500 years after they were written. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's number one. Uh, number two, um, people will accuse me, of course, of many things, but for every assertion I have made in this talk, uh, with virtually no exceptions, I can show you a, a lot of social science research consistent with it and almost no social, social science re research inconsistent with it. And that goes, you know, I cited a couple of articles and on one of the slides where I can give you like lots of literature on this. And I think, I think there are two issues that I think people need to, uh, need to consider and to, and to, you know, think about. Number one, this is a book written for individual success. This is not a book, and as a matter of fact, you began, you, the, the first thing you said is something about organizational success. This is not a book about organizational success. This is a book about individual success. For the last 40 years, most companies, I would say virtually all companies, have said to their employees, we are not responsible for your career. You need to take care of yourself. And so one of the things I tell people all the time is, you know, organizations have been telling you for 40 years you need to look out for yourself. You should take them seriously <laughs> because the evidence is exactly that. You know, the, the, economic, the, the, the times got tough. People got laid off by the scores, by the dozens, uh, at least in the U.S., which doesn't have the wonderful Canadian health care system. 
benefits have been cut, health care plans have been cut, retirements have been cut. In many instances, contractual obligations have been reneged on, even by cities and states in the United States when, uh, when they fail to put enough uh, money away for pensions. So, I, so the first thing I would say is companies have, and organizations of all types have said for the last 30 to 40 years you need to take care of yourself. I think you should. This is, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. This is a story of personal empowerment. Stop waiting for your organization or your leader or your boss to take care of you. They're not going to. Um, hopefully you have loving parents, but your loving parents probably aren't your boss anymore. So you need to, need to take care of yourself and, and look out for yourself. That's, um, that's, I think, a, a very, very important thing um, uh, to keep in mind. The second thing I would say is that there's a huge confusion, huge confusion in the leadership literature and in the organizational behavior literature in general between what should be and what is. So to the best of my ability and to the best of my ability looking at a bunch of data and social science studies, I have not described uh, the world as it should be, or the world of the, you know, and I said this actually in a blog posting that kind of upset my dear friend Bob Sutton about his new book, Good Boss, Bad Boss. Uh, you know, I, there's no question that if you did, if you did what, what the prescription, what the prescriptions are, people would be happier, everybody would be better off, we would live in a much more enlightened and wonderful world. Uh, but for the most part, that is not the world in which we live. And I think, you know, people get, I have, get emails from former students who say, you know, I thought the world was a just and fair place and I, you know, played by the rules and I got blindsided, I got taken out by a competitor, I got fired, I I got this, I got that, and uh, to what I and I say, yes, the world is not a just and fair place, and therefore you have to take care of yourself. So that that would be my response. So uh, that that's, that's that's fantastic. You mentioned um, a couple people have put forward this question. You mentioned the use of anger uh, can be something that is uh, uh, that is a correlate of power. At least it creates an association, and therefore starts to self reinforce people's association of you as powerful. But I, I, w I would assume that you would say that you've got to be careful about how you use it because too, too much can probably have negative repercussions. And I think just for everyone, and the second, and that's sort of a comment, but I'm curious about your reaction to it. And the second is, um, you know, without going into too much detail, but how come you think it's different for women and men? Um, okay, so, so the first thing I would say is that everything I've described in this talk is a skill and you can get better at it for, you know, by, by practicing. And the second thing I would say is that, yes, everything can be overused. I mean, if you have no salt, you'll die. If you have too much salt, it's a poison. Um, you, can actually, you can actually kill yourself by drinking, by consuming too much water. Now, of course, if you don't have any water, you'll die of thirst. So there is absolutely no question that the premise of your question is correct, um, that, uh, that you need to be, number one, skilled in how you do all these things, and number two, um, a moderation is very important. Um, with respect to the differences between women and men, uh, a woman named Victoria Breskall has done some published research that shows that uh, angry women are not perceived as, as, as powerful as non-angry women, while the opposite is true for men. But my colleague Laura Tiedens, who's done the original research on anger, has not found gender differences. So I think the idea, the, the, the thing is kind of still up for grabs. Uh, but in general, uh, I think forceful... Um, uh, kind of more forceful, I will describe it in that word, more forceful behavior is not as well tolerated when it's exhibited by a woman um, as, as by a man. But then again, you know, when Carly Fiorina um, was running for the Senate from California, she did an interview with the San Jose Mercury News, and the quote went something like this. She said, I, well, you know, I was at a meeting, and where once again I was called, you know, literally called out loud, something like the token bimbo, and she said, I decided that I was, you know, fed up with this and I wasn't going to put up with any anymore. And so I think if you look at the, the, the most successful women who have gotten ahead, they have sometimes not had nice adjectives applied to them, uh, but at some point they don't care. They say, you know, I don't need to be liked or loved. As my friend Laura Esserman, who, you know, is an amazing human being and has done some amazing things. She's been written up in the Wall Street Journal and is about to have a big story in Newsweek, said, you know, I said to her, I said, you don't seem to really care about your effect on other people that much. And she said, look, Jeffrey, 45,000 women a year are dying in the United States of breast cancer. She said, no, I don't have time, uh, you know, to, to worry about what everybody is thinking. Remind hello? Me of, uh, yeah, hello, right here. Remind me.
reminds me of the line from A Bronx Tale, a great movie by uh, Chaz Palminter, and he says, is it, is it better to be loved or feared? And really, that's the whole movie is a meditation on that. So I think... Uh, yeah, no, and, that, and that, of course, comes from Machiavelli. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so um, one of the questions that was asked sort of by uh, one of my employees in advance of this, but also brought up by uh, one of the uh, questioners, was really, you're talking a lot about uh, style, right? Places that you are, being appeared in a certain way, and you're not really talking about as much about competency, delivering results, you know, getting, getting things done as the driver of success overall. Is that because you think lots of people have talked about it or because you think actually maybe that's less important relative to the factors that you describe? Okay, I will give you the following three answers. First of all, um, competence at some point becomes table stakes. It's kind of like intelligence, which I also haven't talked about. The higher you rise in an organization, I mean, you're not going to get anywhere if you can't do your job, uh, though I'll contradict that in a minute by also pointing out there's a lot of research that suggests that competence is positively correlated uh, with career success and job performance is positively co correlated with career success, and the relationships are statistically significant, uh, but the effect size isn't that huge. But beyond that, what happens is you, the farther you rise up, the, the, the obviously, if you think about it for a minute, um, the, the more intense uh, the competition becomes because the people who can't compete, who, can't, who aren't very smart, who can't get their jobs done, have fallen by the wayside a long time ago. So, and by the way, it's not also either or. It is, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're good at your job and other people also perceive you as being good at your job because you've built a good reputation, if you know more people because you've networked or whatever, you can think about this as a multiplier effect. So it's competence times the political skills uh, that will bring you even more success. So two, two questions that sort of uh, that spring out from this. One is, uh, I think what you're articulating something that another uh, leadership series uh, talker, uh, speaker, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, mentions, and he has a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, and that's his basic point, right? Like, everyone at the top is good at doing stuff. The differential to become a CEO or to become, I guess, powerful is how you interact with people, how you're perceived, and your, and your awareness and understanding of that. Um, uh, that is certainly correct. As a matter of fact, I cite that book and that book title in, in, in my book on power. I know Marshall well, and that is exactly right. I, and I think that's one of the things uh, that many people don't appreciate is that, is that as you rise up and as your career advances and develops, you do need to develop new skills and new competencies. That's completely correct. I agree with that. Great. So, uh, but what about the flip side? Not large organizations where there is sort of, uh, well, frankly, but I think actually Gary Hamill makes the point that in large organizations, the market is actually suppressed, right? That it's, it's more about bureaucratic power, and that's really what you're, you're uh, one of the things that you're articulating. What about in small, nimble organizations, startups, uh, where often politics is more uh, frowned upon, although I'm not necessarily sure that it, it just takes a different form. How do these um, lessons of power apply to more entrepreneurial, earlier stage environments? Uh, or perhaps areas that are just, frankly, less large, less large organizations? I think they apply equally well. I mean, what I've described, you know, unfortunately, my dear and charming and beautiful wife, Kathleen, has heard this talk and just used it all against me. So this, this stuff all applies even in family dyads, let alone in small organizations. I don't see... You know, I, I've seen uh, founders and co-founders uh, taken out of their small entrepreneurial organizations uh, by their supposed friends and colleagues. I served on the board of a human capital organization that was, I don't know, it wasn't huge, and you know which one I'm talking about, but where, you know, the C. EO at the time brought in a CFO, and, I, and then the CFO said, I want to be on the board, and then he said, I want to be COO, and I said to the, my friend uh, who had brought me on the board, I said, you know, um, this guy is after your job, and he said, well, you know, he said, we're small, a relatively small entrepreneurial company, I don't want to play politics, and the next thing you know, he was out of his, he was out of his position. So I, I really, the, you know, I've seen in relatively small law firms, venture capital firms, management consulting firms, some of which, of course, are large, some of which are smaller, in partnerships. Uh, the dynamics that I'm talking about, I, I believe, obviously, I'm about to say something that I don't completely agree with, are, are reasonably universal. That's
that doesn't mean that some organizations are more or less political than others. But the factors and the forces that I've talked about, I see basically operating pretty much everywhere. And the idea that you are somehow going to go off into a nonprofit, if you look on the back of the book, um, one of the um, um, <clears throat> endorsements is from Jacqueline Novogratz, who wrote The Blue Sweater and founded the uh, this amazing uh, startup that provides funding for you know enterprises all over the world doing social good, the Acumen Fund, and Jacqueline will tell you uh, that much as she doesn't like to think about it, uh, the, this applies in the nonprofit world as well. So I don't find many domains of human activity uh, where the, where, the, where what I've talked about uh, does not apply. I won't ask you about I won't ask you about Ripple. We'll keep that for another conversation. It applies. It applies. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that's sort of underneath what you were you were uh, some of the points you were making was this concept of reciprocity and and that uh, you know Calvini writes about this and influence which is I guess another word for describing power uh, and you know he really focuses on this as like a fundamental sort of law of nature a law of human social interaction that the people who figure out how to use reciprocity in the right ways are able to advance and get credits in this sort of very elaborate social structure of credit. Uh, credit that we allocate to each other. And, and in particular, I think, thinking about when you described um, introducing people to each other, where many people think of that as, uh, you know, it's an imposition, whereas people who, I think, play the game well, in fact, actually how you and I met through Roger Martin, who's an investor in our company, you know, I once asked him, how, how do you do this? And he said, look, I, I always am introducing people because it's a benefit for me because it's a benefit to, the, to both sides. Like they both think that they, I did something good for them and all I did was introduce them. And yet some people figure that out and some people don't. I guess what I'm trying to get un underneath it is where does reciprocity as a general sort of nature, uh, general law of human interaction, social science, how does that play into power? Well, I think, you've, I think you've answered your own question. Reciprocity is obviously a general social norm and people always believe that they need to um, – return favors. So I actually, it's interesting, I should do a study of this. What I actually think, you know, I, I think there is a, a norm of reciprocity, and I think people do uh, often feel compelled to repay, repay favors that have been done for them in the past, but there's also gratitude is in relatively short supply in most organizations. So I think it's not just reciprocity. I think the assumption is in the case of, you know, that if Roger has introduced you to interesting people in the past, he will probably, as long as you keep on his good side and are nice to him and reciprocate uh, the help that he's provided you, he'll probably do it again in the future. So you have not only, uh, if you will, thanks for past favors, but you also have implicit in the idea that, that people can bring you together or introduce you or get you known or get you in the media or something, that they will be able to do future favors for you. So I think there's both reciprocity and expectations that are often built into these um, interactions that you're describing. Yeah, I, I think maybe that goes back to the sort of be nice thing is often, uh, you know, at least in talking about, about him, but also talking to a lot of people, they just they do these things because they enjoy them, right? It's not necessarily explicit reciprocity that are expecting the credit back. Your point is the gratitude is often reciprocity enough. They feel good doing something or encourage you to do something nice for other people as, as they go forward. Oh, one of the questions that came in, and it, it is this, this thing that, uh, you know, personally I struggle with, which is you want to be liked, you want to be a nice person, uh, but you're right, that sort of element of toughness is required. Uh, and I, I guess the question is, do you think arrogance is correlated with power as well uh, as sort of the negative correlation to niceness? Or is it sort of, it, it's, it, you, don't have to, you don't have to be nice, but you don't have to be the opposite or mean or evil or arrogant or whatever those negative words are. So I'm trying to tease out, is there a state that you can be in where you're both powerful, uh, necess not necessarily nice, but you're not in a place where uh, you're, you're impacting your own self-worth, I guess? Um, well, you know, I think that's an interesting question, and I think the question, you know, I guess the, there's a Buddhist saying, not always so, which I actually believe. I think many people oftentimes think that they need to be consistent, and I don't think people are consistent, um, that how you manage up 
may be different than how you manage down, may be different than how you manage laterally. To take one interesting example, I, there are many people who are very nice and very participative and very supportive of their subordinates, but see their role as a department manager or as a division general manager uh, to, uh, to argue and advocate for uh, their particular unit in the larger organization. And so, they're, they're, and so they may be hard on their bosses, even as they are very nice to their subordinates. Robert Moses, the famous New York City Parks Commissioner, being one. So that's number one. Number two, I don't think you need to behave the same uh, way consistently throughout your career. One of the interesting things was the endorsement on the cover of this book is by Jim Collins. And I was actually, even though I've known Jim for a thousand years, I was kind of a little anxious to, um, to, you know, send him the manuscript and try to ask for his endorsement because I figured most of the things I've described uh, are not really consistent with, in quotes, his idea of level, level five leadership. And so when the Jim and I had a very long conversation on the phone before he did the endorsement, and he said, let me tell you something about level five leaders. Number one, level five leaders were not always so, in quotes, level five as they climbed their way up the organizational hierarchy. A lot of these very nice, participative, uh, generous People uh, became nice, participative, and generous uh, only when they uh, only when they reach more senior ranks. And I think that that, that is probably right. Uh, so I so so I think your your question poses a universal, which I think is not you know. So not only do you need to be, and people behave differently moment to moment. I mean, you know, it's the anger. People display anger oftentimes strategically uh, because getting angry is, of course, very harmful. Anger is one of the most cognitively debilitating emotions. If I make you angry, you can't even add a column of numbers uh, very well, uh, let alone be a very, very effective in any kind of organizational context. So a lot of this is is, this, is displaying emotion strategically, and then and strategic is an interesting word. If I said Ripple needs to be strategic with respect uh, to how it navigates the human capital. Uh, software space, nobody would disagree with that. But when I say to people, and it's just as true, you need to be strategic about how you navigate your career, and you don't, you know, you need to be strategic in who you spend time with, you need to be strategic about getting known and making yourself visible, and doing all of these things, a lot of this is around intentionality and thoughtfulness, and not just assuming, you know, we'll do a good job and everything will take care of itself. Yeah, that uh, makes me think of a, another speaker we've had, uh, Stephen Miles, who's the vice chair of Heinrich and Struggles. He wrote a book called Your Career Game, and he applied game theory to the idea that you have to navigate your career in that way. Think strategically about what you're doing, exactly the same idea. So I want, I want to end off, uh, a couple of people asked questions about the idea of, of connections and in order to build power that you, you, know, you have to network, you have to build your brand. Um, and, and also dovetailing it with something you just mentioned, the idea of a split between your work persona uh, and your, your personal persona, who you are in the real world, who you are in the work world, and that they don't have to necessarily be the same person. Um, uh, the question really is, how do you see, to the extent you, you think there is an impact, uh, kind of social networks broadly, uh, LinkedIn in particular, playing into these two elements where your, the line between your personal and social and work is blurring as people have much more information reputationally about how you behave and if you do behave consistently through the whole arc of your life. And second, sort of that the nature of connection, these weak ties, can actually take into extreme. One of the questions is, you know, people on LinkedIn who are constantly trying to connect with you, but there's no real context. Um, I wonder if you've thought about how sort of technology is changing this power game uh, at all. Wow. Um, well, uh, given <laughs> it's an interesting question. Uh, so first of all, you know, when Jack Valenti, the late head of the Motion Picture Association of America, who ran rings around the the high tech industry and passing the Digital Media Copyright Act, as he used to say, he said, "There's no." There was an article written about him in the New Yorker, and the title of the article summed it up: "The Personal Touch." Um, I think there is still no substitute. It is much harder if, if Daniel asks me something in person, it is harder for me to say no than if you ask me on the phone. And if you ask me over the Internet, it's much easier to say no. And so, you know, personal connections and personal ties uh, remain important. Um, and, and uh, you know, obviously you want to maintain close face-to-face -face or telephonic connections with the people who are most important to you. So I'm not so sure... Uh, this network stuff has, has necessarily changed uh, the principles all that much. With respect to reputation, well, you know, I, that's not a subject 
uh, which I know a lot. I mean, there are, of course, now products called Reputation Defender and all these other things, which are supposed to protect you. And there's been a whole thing about uh, these um, consumer uh, rating sites like TripAdvisor at all to try to help you from, uh, you know, overcoming this stuff. And at the end, uh, you know, I'm not sure there's, you know, there may be a Gresham's Law, which, you know, bad data drives out the good, but I actually don't necessarily believe that. I think people in your work context, I mean, forget, you know, all this other stuff. I mean, most of the people who are going to be in a position to advance your career are not going to know you through LinkedIn or through some, you know, Facebook page or something. They're going to know you through, 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 through your job and through interacting with you and through, and through something much more, much deeper than that. And so, and so I'm really talking about, you know, kind of a career and career success and, and, uh, and, and rising up in an organizational hierarchy in which I think the personal contacts and your, and your performance and, and that kind of thing is going to matter a lot more than this other stuff. So I also tell people that they need to worry much more about privacy than most of them do. <laughs> well, Jeff, that was really fantastic. I, I really appreciated you taking the time to come on and share the ideas that you have in this latest book. I encourage everyone to go off and pick up a copy of the book. It's called Power by Jeff Pepper, uh, available in all the finer bookstores everywhere. Um, We'll continue to do uh, these Ripple Leadership Seminars. Our next one is with Dave Logan, or the author of Tribal Leadership, and that's on the 6th. Oh, May 26th, sorry. Uh, you can check out our website, uh, ripple.com, R-Y-P-P-L-E.com, to find out uh, specific dates and times. Uh, and I uh, just want to say thanks again to Jeff for, uh, for sharing this. One last comment is that if you'd like to share this presentation uh, and the audio, we will have, by about the same time tomorrow, up on our uh, website and our blog, a link to an audio recording and to the slides. Jeff, thanks again. Thank you.